Welcome to my channel, Stories from the Net. Today we have a few tales to share with you, so stay tuned and hit the subscribe box and smash that like button if you like the content you are viewing. In the subreddit writing prompts, the user Clorox Bleach submits an interesting essay idea. When summoning a demon, something very unexpected happens. The demon bellows through the fire and smoke, who dares to call upon me, mortal. Wait, dude, is that really you? The demonic voice immediately switches to the familiar voice of your high school best friend, who died years ago. The user Green Giant responds with this gem. I finished chalking the last abyssal symbol, and threw the ignition powder onto the circle. Before I could use my lighter, the chalk burst into flame. I stumbled back coughing, blinded from the sudden burst of light, and nearly fell to the ground. The short, razor-sharp dagger tucked inside my belt dug into my skin, as if in warning. A demon had arrived. A voice boomed out from the chaos and fire. Who dares to call upon me, mortal? Wait, Jackie. That voice, no. I squinted. The flaming circle was just barely dying down, the smoke swirling into an obscure torrent of horns and wings and finally coalescing into an achingly familiar form. A sneer erupted on my face just in time to hide my shock. Stay strong, Jackie. You know it's just trying to trick you. I forced myself to stand upright, cocky. All right, demon. I'm not playing your sick games. I already know how this works. My foot sent the ingredient box, deceptively light for the weight inside, sliding across the floor to the edge of the circle, which now smoldered an angry shade of blackish-orange. The demon didn't look down. It was staring, wearing her face. I forced myself to look it in the eye, to ignore the way its familiar dark eyes stared wide like I was an old friend. Even the way its midnight hair fell was the same. She was the same from her cheekbones to the curve of her slender shoulders to the old combat boots she wore day after day, it really was her. No. No way was I going to hesitate now. Hesitation would give it the chance it needed to trick me, to take my soul. Well, demon. I resisted the urge to cross my arms defensively. I couldn't show weakness. Not now. Not when I was so close. Take it. Lamb's blood, which is hair. Wolf's entrails, I have everything you need to complete the contract, down to the last ingredient. It still didn't look down. Jackie. She, it, said. It's me, Abby. Really? It held out its hands peacefully. I could even see the scar across her palm from when we were kids and she fell off the old rusted swing. She stepped forward. My grin was sardonic. You're good. Really good. But you already know I'm looking for the real thing. No fakes. No bullshit. Give it up, demon. Abby's eyebrows tilted up tragically. Jackie, it's really me. Please. Her voice broke. She sounded scared. Tears welled up in her eyes as she took another step toward me, almost to the edge of the circle. Her palms were open, facing toward the low, dank ceiling, as if about to bow down in prayer. My mask was breaking already. The sound of her voice, Abby's voice, after all those years, nearly made me crumble right then and there, but then my dagger once again seemed to pulse in warning, growing hot against my back. I took a deep shaky breath. Abby, I trailed off and looked away. When I looked up again, she'd taken another step and now stood at the very edge of the chalk. I stepped toward her, one foot purposefully after another. Abby, how are you here? She shook her head. Please, let's just go. They're going to come find me, if we don't leave. She extended one arm, hovering right above the chalk, toward me. Pleading. Vulnerable. A lost friend in need of help. For another long moment, one that seemed to stretch away into an eternity, I almost considered it. But then I grabbed the dagger swiftly from my belt, and held it to the demon's throat. The demon's eyes, still Abby's, widened in fear. I could tell it was only half an act. Jackie, what are you doing? I told you to knock it the fuck out. You all are getting clever down there. For a moment, you really had me going. Using the face of one of your victims. Real clever. I smirked. Jackie, please. I made a mistake. I made a deal. On my birthday, the night I disappeared. 
I just wanted, you know what happens when you make a deal. Please. It was now shaking. Demons hated my dagger and anything else blessed by the light. I shook my head and snarled, no, you don't hit it, demon. My voice echoed around the darkness of the cave like it was trying to escape. You eat souls. You've eaten souls and you will again. You're not human. And you're not Abby. I gripped the dagger tighter. Abby, Abby has died a long time ago. And you killed her. So now you need to die. It broke into sobs. I know I'm not human, but please. I'm still Abby. Please, Jackie, I made a mistake. I just wanted you to- My gleaming dagger sunk true and deep, and the demon fell to the ground. Its human body twitched once, twice, thrice, and then the facade slipped to reveal its grotesque true form. I stared down at it for a long time, thinking. I might have cried, or talked, or just stood in the silence I don't remember anymore. But eventually I cleaned the blood from my dagger, grabbed by box full of blood, hair, and entrails, and left. In the same theme as this story, user Red 580 submits his writing prompt idea. In the Demon Hunters Academy you are known as the very best professor, 80 years old but still in your prime, but you're secretly a demon, and the academy recently got some new demonic detectors, and as opposed to the old ones, these actually work. You can only avoid the main hall for so long. So the user a bit of kindness blessed us with this script of his. I looked at the metal detectors, shaped like an upside down U, that stood at every entrance to the main hall. For a good two months, I had found every reason to avoid them. I'd actually become quite good at it. It became fun, after a while, like a brain teaser puzzle. And I couldn't help but bring my students into it. This was the perfect opportunity for them to learn. Standing before it now with a small group of upperclassmen arrayed behind me, I raised my voice above the general hubbub of Kefri conversation and asked them what the flaws in this system were. They looked at me blankly. I told them to imagine they were demons. How would a demon evade these detectors? How might a demon view this seemingly normal addition to school security? In what ways could a demon evade detection? And I told them that was their capstone assignment for the year and dismissed them from class. The good ones were excited, talking together about the interesting new project that hadn't been on the syllabus. The handful of freeriders were not allowed to be in groups, so they had to think of it on their own. All they had to do was figure out all the tricks and write me a paper by the end of the semester. Oh, then you'd have a bunch of new ideas to keep your identity secret. You may think. No. I am a teacher first. My greatest hope was that these brilliant students would test their ideas, perhaps find out how to fix these flaws, and maybe even send their ideas to the production companies that installed the detectors. But then the two laziest freeriders walked into my office one day, both pale and twitchy, and Gordon said, Mr. Bartholo, um, about the assignment. I looked at him patiently, I looked at him patiently, glancing once at Rick. Gordon stared at my desk and muttered, Mr. Bartholo, you're a demon, aren't you? I thought panic would rise within me, but I am pleased to announce that it was overwhelming pride. Unable to conceal my smile, I prodded, what makes you say that? Rick answered. We realized you're doing all the things we figured a demon would do to evade the detectors. He glanced at Gordon, back at me. I beamed at my two pupils. If no one else in all my years of teaching understood how to hunt demons, I would still be satisfied that these two understood the heart of the assignment. You two will make fine demon hunters one day, I said a little gruffly, choking on my emotion. After the last student left my office, I began to pack up my things. Into the box went the textbooks I had co-written for aspiring demon hunters. Into the box went the cylindrical tube of maggot tinker toys that I used as helpful visual aids in my stratagem classes. Into the box went thank you cards, papers, pencils, my desk name placard, and the cute demon puppet one artistic student had made for me twenty years ago. I paused when I picked up the picture frame. Nestled within the silver scrollwork frame was the image of Rick and Gordon, arms across each other's shoulders and tassels in their eyes. On one side, I stood grinning at the camera. On their other side, the president of the university beamed joyfully. I smiled fondly on the memory of those boys. How quickly they'd gone from lazy low achievers to political freight trains, practically bullying the school board to change the official curriculum for my class. Many, many decades had gone by since then. I couldn't even remember how many students flocked to my classes for the mystery capstone project that had become so popular. All they knew going in was that those who came out with an A ended up being the best demon hunters in the business. Those who figured out my secret invariably got special recommendation letters and they gave me swore to keep quiet so as to keep the mystery alive. I gently placed the framed photograph on top of the rest of my office things in the box. I'd found out recently that both died to a demon ambush.
I hadn't been able to keep up with them in the intervening years, but after their death reached the papers, I found out they'd successfully ousted one of the most deeply rooted demon spy networks in the government. They died as heroes. They died as some of the best. Every major and minor news outlet had vied for a comment from the man who trained them, but I refused every one. A week later, I put in for my retirement at the end of the semester. So many of my students had died. Some died peacefully in their sleep, but many died in the line of duty. I was justly proud and unbearably sad. My office was sparse and hollow in the wake of my packing, everything neatly organized in the box. I sat in my chair, buried my face into my hands, and cried. I scraped the last bit of food on my plate in my hellhound's bowl and put the plate in the sink. The clock on the wall ticked loudly in the silence, and the gray dusk hugged the old house. I peered out the open glass door to the back porch, wondering why my dog hadn't come in yet. I froze when I saw a lone figure standing at the far end of my yard, where the open green met the dark tree line. The figure was slender and pale, seeming to shimmer in the one light of the setting sun and the half moon peering over the treetops. My dog sat before the figure, her back to me, looking up at them with pricked ears. I cautiously crossed the yard to meet them, assured by my dog's calm. As I approached, the figure held up a hand, so I stopped a few paces away. I couldn't tell if the figure was male or female, just that they were beautiful in graceful form. Silver hair shimmered as they nodded in greeting. Good evening, Kakrinalas, the figure said. I marveled at the name that I hadn't heard in centuries. Ever since I had turned my life to teaching, I had changed my name to hide my true identity. I wondered briefly who this was who knew me, but an instant later, I realized who it must be. You're one of the angels, aren't you? I asked. I had never seen one before. The angel nodded with a smile. So to what do I owe the pleasure? I asked. Can I invite you in for some tea? The smile broadened. Thank you, Kakrinalas, but this is a short visit. I have come to invite you in for eternity. I stared at them. Acknowledging my hesitation, the angel went on. You have been given special access to heaven, if you so choose. I shook my head. Why would a demon be allowed into heaven? It seems there are two souls among us who are very adamant that you be allowed to become an angel. I almost asked who they were talking about, but my voice caught in my throat when I realized who it must be. I grinned, tears blurring my eyes. Can my dog come? The angel laughed. A gentle sound of happy memories, and said. Of course. Thank you for watching. If you like what you viewed, please subscribe below, and we will be coming back for more stories a few times every week.